put about memory stores and resistive switching mechanism. Uh, the organizers will hang on and myself have from you. We are very happy that you accepted our invitations. And um, uh, we are really glad that all of us share uh, excitement about the field. And it really looks like the last couple of years <coughs> point in the direction of uh, um, getting much broader attention uh, for our field and uh, a much larger impact both in academia and in the industrial laboratories. Um, uh, we saw that we will start with a couple of specifics uh, uh, for our conference. First of all, I would like to recognize uh, Katrina Evans, uh, who uh, stands in the back uh, without whose help uh, this conference would have not happened. Thank you, Katrina. <laughs> Um, uh, Katrina and the help uh, uh, sits right outside at the registration desk if you need help. Furthermore, uh, there are four people in the room with the name organizer on their name tag, Ola Maiso, and two student helpers, um, uh, Dustin and uh, Duke. Uh, they, uh, please turn to them if you have any questions. Uh, first and foremost, we would like to recognize uh, our uh, supporting organizations, which is the National Science Foundation and ICANN, which is Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter. Uh, they are a remarkable and meritorious institution. Uh, ICANN supports uh, worldwide exchanges, meetings, uh, trips, exchange students, uh, and they are wide open for business. If meetings like this inspire you to uh, apply to ICANN for support of your future conferences and programs, please do so. They are very interested in that. Part of being supported uh, by ICANN is that we uh, make our uh, workshop available to the wide public. The camera, what you see there, is a live webcast camera. Uh, that is, we, are, we set up the facility that the talks will be actually streamed through the internet and people can see it simultaneously. Now this raises of course an issue, so we are asking every speaker that uh, tell the organizer prior your talk if you don't want your talk being a uh, 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 webcast. Okay? If there are any kind of concerns, let us know up front and then we switch off the camera. Good. Yeah, there is this form there. Which is yes. Yeah. So there is a release form, so those of you who agreed that your, uh, that your talk can be webcast, here are the release forms we are asking you to sign. We understand the sensitivities about industrial research and so on. Uh, so please make it very clear because this thing goes out, we cannot take it back. Okay? Once, you, once you didn't propose the, the webcasting of your talk, it will go out and, and uh, it's, it's a fact. Uh, uh, registration. Uh, um, the registration fee, uh, you are uh, uh, kindly uh, reminded that the registration fees, the uh, sole purpose is uh, to cover the food uh, which is uh, uh, provided uh, to us. So it is a gentle reminder that this was our motivation to, uh, to uh, uh, point out that there is a registration fee. And uh, we kindly appreciate uh, those of you uh, who have and made sure that you are registered. And we have, there is, uh, at the desk out there, if you haven't registered, we have set up so you can do so out there. And, uh, please do, when you have a chance. All right, uh, so uh, the food will be very straightforward. The coffee breaks, there will be coffee and little uh, uh, finger uh, desserts served outside, just outside the hallway. Lunch and dinner will be served on the other side of this wall, so everything is right here. Uh, we can stay around and uh, nothing will uh, interrupt the flow of communication and discussion, which is one of the primary reasons. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Gary. So, uh, poster session tomorrow afternoon, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. We'll also be in here when we have the conference dinner tomorrow. The poster boards will be available at 2 p.m. There will be tax available too, with which you can put up your posters. Uh, the invited talks are total 45 minutes. We try to keep it to 35 minute talk plus 10 minutes question and answer. And oral contributed talks about plus 3 minutes or 15 minutes long. We have a microphone, please use it. Um, after lunch, today and tomorrow, we set aside a time for basically interaction time to so talk to people, discuss uh, some fun. Please don't run off and check your email during that entire block of time. Uh, also cell phones, please turn them off or make them quiet or something like that so you don't have cell phones going off during the uh, presentation. 
And uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Amanda Pitford Long at Arvin National Laboratory, who will chair the morning session. Good morning. So the first talk this morning is from Stan Williams from Judith Packard, and his title is Making and Measuring Progress. Okay. Uh, 
So something that can switch in 10 nanoseconds and take the state for geological time frames is a very interesting thing indeed. Scaling limits, well, we think that we can get one terabit per layer. And when I'm really getting giddy, I think we can stack a thousand layers. So we're talking exabits in a uh, per square centimeter type of uh, system. Uh, endurance and failure mechanisms, we understand those very well. I probably won't talk about that very much. Uh, nature of, of on-off states is sort of like a better insulated transition. And I'll, I'll, I'll be describing electroforming essentially as a historical issue. Uh, uh, it's not required. I mean, if you actually know how to make the devices, you don't need to do electroforming. And that will come out to tomorrow with some uh, talks uh, from some, some other people in, in, in the group. So for uh, 150 years or so, we very, very happily went along with three fundamental two-terminal passive devices, the resistor, capacitor, and inductor. Uh, that sort of changed uh, in 1971 when uh, uh, well, actually, in, you know, sort of in the 1960s when uh, Leon Chua, who's going to be the second speaker in this uh, session, essentially, for the first time, put nonlinear circuit theory on a firm mathematical foundation. All right? So in doing that, you know, being a very clever guy, he essentially saw that for nonlinear circuits, there was a hole in this set of devices. And he... Uh, filled the hole by defining a device that he called the memristor and working out the mathematical characteristics of that device. Now, there's a couple of different ways of, of looking at that. One is using this, this integral approach here, uh, which you know has, has confused some people, shall we say, because it says something about magnetic flux is equal to something about charge, and that may very well be why it took so long to figure out what memristance actually was, because this equation doesn't say anything about causality. It just says something about equality, right? And so as long as this equation is obeyed, you've got a memristor. So you don't have to have a magnetic flux involved in the mechanism of memristance as long as at the end of the day, this equation is obeyed. What I'll show you is that you can get that equation to be obeyed without causality. So, another way of looking at this same uh, equation is the differential approach, which actually turns out to be more useful and more interesting. And so there is this approach for looking at essentially at the same thing in which you have two equations. One is a quasi-static conduction equation which tells you what the relationship between current and voltage is at any instant in time. And then there's a second equation, which is very important because these devices are dynamical. They evolve in time, and therefore, every measurement that you make on one of these devices must explicitly be a function of time. If you are not keeping track of time in your measurements, you are not making a good measurement. Okay? And so this equation here is the, uh, uh, the, an equation in which one or more state variables are defined. And you can follow the evolution of the system by looking at how <coughs> these state variables evolve in time. So in fact, when you are looking at a memristor, you must look at two equations. You must <coughs> measure the system in terms of both of these equations. You need the instantaneous or the quasi-static conduction and the temporal evolution of the state variables. Why is memristance uh, essentially a fundamental issue for circuits? Well, here's my way of taking a look at this. If you, if you put <coughs> essentially in current voltage type of characteristics, resistor, and, and by resistor here, Resistor is, is anything that doesn't have a hysteresis loop in it. So a diode, a, a tunneling gap, uh, anything uh, uh, like this uh, that has uh, essentially a you know, non-hysteretic behavior is a resistor uh, in, in, in this viewpoint. Capacitor, inductor, now capacitor and inductor look the same here, but they're 180 degrees out of phase. And then here's the resistor. And the issue is that there's absolutely no way of constructing this current voltage characteristic from any circuit that contains only these types of elements. 
All right? Now, you can emulate this with a circuit that contains a bunch of transistors, and that's fine, and, and, and Leon did that uh, uh, almost 40 years ago. Uh, but, but what this gives you is a really interesting new tool in your toolkit. It turns out that this type of functionality, this memory functionality, is very important in a broad range of integrated circuits. And to emulate this functionality often takes maybe 15 or 20 transistors. And so it turns out that there are many interesting types of circuits in which you can rip out maybe 20 transistors and replace those transistors with a single passive device, an emristor, and thereby achieve significant compaction of the circuit. This is a way of essentially going along with Moore's law without making the transistors any smaller. All right. So this is a, this is a, a one of the major things that's got us so excited about uh, about this device. So it turns out that people have been making emristors. Well, I think Leon found a, a reference going all the way back to 1908. But uh, people have been making emristors and 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 viewing them for a while and publishing on them. Uh, for a long time. Oops, I, I, I did forget to state one thing. Well, no. The primary characteristic when you look at a current voltage uh, trace of a memristor is this, what Leon calls a pinched hysteresis loop. Okay? And so people have been seeing these pinched hysteresis loops for 100 years, and they had no idea what they were. They would say that it's anomalous capacitance. Well, it can't be capacitance because it's a pinched hysteresis loop. The thing is going through zero. These things don't store charge. They don't store energy. Okay? Uh, so there's been a, a, a very, there's been hundreds of papers published in which people have done very interesting experiments, have reported these pinched hysteresis loops, but, but they simply have no idea that they were dealing with a different type of beast. That they have that, that they had an emristor in their hands and they didn't know what to do with it. Or they didn't know how to how, how to characterize it. And you know we were among that group. I mean, for 10 years we were uh, measuring these things, the, you know, things that have pinched hysteresis loops, and we were going crazy because we didn't know if the switching was dependent on, on current or voltage or power. You know, uh, there, there was just no way of, uh, of for us to figure out what was going on until until we had the framework of the memristor world. So in our lab, uh, the types of devices that we've been working with and, and, and which we've published on. Uh, tend to look like this. We have a bottom wire, uh, which uh, is, is usually made of platinum, but it can be uh, on many other metals as well. We put a thin film of titanium dioxide, which essentially covers an entire substrate. And then we put another wire uh, of, of uh, platinum uh, uh, orthogonal to that. And essentially, the titanium dioxide uh, uh, sandwich between two pieces of, of, of platinum uh, gives you the um, the memristor, and we have made these devices and published on devices anyway, which range in size from 50 nanometers down to 16 microns, uh, and we've made devices that are even smaller than this, significantly small. But if you have a device like this, and if you go through, you know, if, if this is the type of device you have with a 30 nanometer a thickness film, you have to go through what's called a uh, uh, an electroforming process. But then after you do that, you get this type of current voltage characteristic if you do the measurement properly. If you don't put it on, on I mean, if you, if you put this thing on a curve tracer, usually these, these curves will look really ugly. Uh, but if you do it, uh, you know, if you essentially measure voltage and current as a function of time, and then from those measurements construct your IV curves, then you get some, then you start to get something that's reasonable. Now, this is an asymmetric suite. What you see is that for some reason, turning the device off it slows down. So there's some issue that, that it's harder to turn the device off than it is to turn on. The devices turn on very, very fast, but there's something that slows them down uh, when, when you turn them off. Uh, so that's a, 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 a sort of an interesting issue. And you can see also that, that these particular devices are very nonlinear. In its off state, it is, it is essentially a diode, and the on state is essentially a tunneling junction. All right, so how did we explain this, at least at the level of, of, of a freshman uh, in you know, taking a, a double E or a physics class? Okay, so this was, this was the explanation that we published uh, a year and a half ago in Nature 
for how this type of system worked. So the idea is that one has two electrodes, metal electrodes, and a titanium dioxide or other similar material in, uh, in the middle. And it turns out that titanium dioxide itself is a wide band gap semiconductor. It has a band gap of roughly 3 eV, depending upon the form it's in. And what we found is we can make memristors out of amorphous, rutile, or uh, anatase uh, material. It doesn't matter the, the actual crystalline nature of the material. However, if you remove some oxygen from the lattice, if you have oxygen vacancies in titanium dioxide, it's a self-doped material. Those oxygen vacancies act as donors to the lattice, and they are positively charged. And so if one applies a positive voltage to this electrode over here, it is possible to cause the oxygen vacancies to drift to the left, and thereby make this region here, this part of the, of the semiconductor, narrower. And when you do that, you decrease the resistance of the device. All right? If you then invert the polarity on the device, you will essentially cause the vacancies to drift to the right, and the resistance of the device will go back up. So that's the nature of on and off. However, if you look at this, this simple explanation, there's, none, there's, there's nothing in here that would give it an asymmetry in terms of the on and off switch. But uh, as I said, this, this first paper that we published was simply intended to point out uh, at, 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 a, at a very uh, you know, freshman type of level uh, what was going on and to show that this was, a, in fact, uh, a main risk. Uh, so this is the, the, the equations or the freshman level uh, explanation, the idea being that this type of device is essentially two variable resistors in series and that as you essentially push vacancies uh, back and forth, you are essentially changing the resistance of, shall we say, a doped region and an, and an undoped region, just as though you had a slide wire uh, or two slide wires going back and forth. Now, the interesting issue is that the equations that describe <coughs> the system here are identical to these two equations that Leon wrote down for the definition of the members. And so that shows that at least this simple model is a memristor. And the other interesting issue is that having written down uh, the two equations, the quasi-static uh, uh, <coughs> conduction equation, uh, I mean, I mean, this is the, this is the uh, dynamical equation and the quasi-static conduction equation, you can then calculate the memristance of the device. And for this simple linear model, this is a model of linear drift and ohmic conduction, you see that the memristance has this factor of 1 over d squared in it. In other words, the, the, the strength of the memristance, if you will, is inversely proportional to the size of the device. That means that the memristance is a million times larger at the nanometer scale than at the micron scale. And at the millimeter scale, it's essentially unobservable. And so what does this mean? Well, that's one of the reasons why it's taken so long to figure this out. We've had to get into sort of the nanometer scale before memristance became essentially important enough that we could really observe it and really start to play with it. Okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, now that we're there, uh, memristance is essentially popping up all over the place. You can read, and we have read, and found literally hundreds of papers in the literature where people are, are, are going crazy about history, hysteretic effects that are showing up in their, in, in their nanoscale circuits. Well, what are those hysteretic effects? They're not capacitance, they're not inductance. That's what people are saying in the papers, anomalous capacitance, anomalous inductance. You can see those words all over the place. They're not, it's memristance. Their dopants are moving. They've got very, very high fields. You've got a small gap, you've got a, a you know, a nominal voltage that creates high fields that causes atoms to move. That's the, that's the basis for memristance. And that's what's going on. Now, that was the freshman level of explanation. However, as we sort of climb the level to maybe the, the, uh, a junior level class, we understand that in fact, uh, you don't just have drift when you put a uh, a bias voltage across two plates and you've got something inside, you have drift and diffusion. And so when you write 
the uh, equations uh, for uh, a semiconductor device simulator, of course, you are solving the full drift diffusion equations for the system. Now, to, to emulate or to simulate a memristor properly, you have to have not only the drift and diffusion of the electrons and holes, you have to have the drift and diffusion of the dopants in the system since they're moving. And so we had essentially to rewrite the codes that are used for simulating uh, device physics to include uh, 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 drift and diffusion of, of ions or dopants in the system and include that in the Poisson equation. And so what you find is that you've got coupled motion. You're coupling the equations of motion of the dopants and the carriers in the device. That's another way of thinking about what memristance is. It's coupled motion of carriers and dopants. And so uh, we've done quite <coughs> simulations in which we've uh, 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 looked at all of this. And we can look at, uh, in those simulations, how the uh, uh, dopants are moving in the device as we apply uh, 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 positive or negative voltages. And so here is a simulation of, of switching from an on state. And the on state is essentially characterized by a system in which the entire uh, uh, width of the device has uh, some sort of uniform distribution of dopants in it. But then as we apply a positive bias voltage to this side of the device, we cause the, the, the dopants to drift to the left. And as they drift to the left, the, the, the resistance of the device goes up. So that's on to off switching. And what you see, this is the, the calculated distribution of the dopants in the device. And you can see how sharp that, that diffusion front is. And it's, it's effectively straight up and down. That's what the freshman level model assumed. And so at this level, at the, at the junior level model, we see that that the assumption actually wasn't too bad. But there's something else that comes out of this particular assumption here. Because we're looking at both drift and diffusion, in this particular case, when we're going off switching, what we're doing is we're increasing the concentration of vacancies here as we turn the device off. And of course, when you do that, you've got an opposite Dickian diffusion pushing back in the other direction. Okay. And so as you switch the device off, it slows down. It's harder to turn the device off because the drift is being opposed by diffusion in the device. However, when you're turning the device on from the off state to the on state, the diffusive current and the drift current are essentially pointing in the same direction. So on switching is very fast. Right? This is the, this is the, 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 the basis for the asymmetry in these switching curves depending upon whether diffusion and drift are anti-parallel or parallel. And we've studied this uh, in, in, in gory detail, looking at switching times for on and off. And you know, for, for constant voltage or constant current, current switching, for instance, the on switching uh, uh, can be easily 100 times faster than the off switching of a device to get essentially between the same two sites doesn't mean that you can't make the off switching very fast, but the, off, but the on switching is, is always faster. Now, here's a problem. Uh, if you have this issue of drift diffusion in your system, there's something called the Einstein-Nernst relationship between, essentially, the speed of the drift and the speed of the diffusion. And if you essentially put numbers into that and calculate for any reasonable system, what you would, what you would measure or what you would assume is that the lifetime of a state would only be, at maximum, a factor of 1,000 longer than the switching time. And so if you have a system that you can switch in a nanosecond, the lifetime of the state, according to einstein nernst relationship, would only be a microsecond. That wouldn't be a very useful device. <coughs> in fact, what I stated is that we make measurements where we see switching times in the order of nanoseconds, but lifetimes on the order of years. So what's going on? Well, the issue is, that, uh, and Dina Surkoff actually worked this out independently, uh, uh, at high fields in these solid state systems, the uh, drift velocity is no longer uh, directly proportional to the, to the size of the field. It turns out that if you have very large fields, the drift velocity becomes exponentially dependent upon the field. And uh, we were very pleased with this and thought about you know, writing up a paper and submitting it to Nature, but then I made the big mistake of looking in the literature to see if anybody else had ever found this. And of course, uh, it turns out that Neville Mott 
uh, published a paper in 1940 in which he also had derived this. And there were experiments done in the 1950s in which people had measured this, this, uh, uh, this effect. But it seemed to have been forgotten. We kind of rediscovered that. Uh, but if you essentially think about the, 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 the device consequence, the practical consequence of this, it's actually wonderful. Because what it means is you can have an extraordinarily large dynamic range between the lifetime of the device and the switching speed. In fact, that it can be uh, 20 or 30 orders of magnitude uh, if, if you start to look at it. And especially if you start to think about the fact that if you are passing current through one of these devices, they also heat up. So if you look at both the effects of temperature and this uh, exponential drift with the applied electric field, you can, get, you, can, you can essentially find extraordinarily large dynamic ranges in which uh, it takes literally millions of years for a vacancy in one of these crystals to diffuse one nanometer, but it can drift that one nanometer in a nanosecond or less. In other words, it can have drift velocities of one meter per second. So, now, let's, uh, let's start to actually start making some, some devices and, and, and testing. And so here is uh, 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 sort of the, the, the standard type of thing that people do. They make a device and they, and they, and they sort of zap it with uh, a, a voltage, and that voltage can either be uh, negative or positive. You can form these devices either way. Uh, and so we've done a lot of studies on that. And so there's a, a paper that we published uh, uh, last year in nanotechnology with uh, Joshua Yang as the first author, in which we go through a lot of this. We have some really cool videos uh, on, on the web that you can download and take a look at uh, for how these devices work. But what's interesting about these devices is that when you're doing this electroforming, if you look at it under a, under a microscope, you actually see little volcanoes forming. All right, you have little eruptions on the, uh, on, 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 on the, uh, 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 the metal interface, and you can see holes in, in these things. You look down, and there's something uh, down inside of there. Uh, so we've done quite a bit of, quite a bit of studies looking at, the, at, at, at this volcano formation. Uh, here's a, 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 a side view of, uh, in, in TEM. Uh, what happened was that uh, here was the, uh, uh, the metal contact, and obviously there was some gas generated here uh, inside of the device, and it blew out the top of the, uh, of, of the metal contact. This is not a type of device that you actually want to sell uh, in the market. Uh, it's, it's dependent on volcano blowing uh, but, uh, but, but it did was it, it taught us quite a bit. It, we learned a lot from studying these light reform devices. And without getting into a lot of the details, essentially what goes on in these devices is when you put, for instance, a, a uh, bias voltage on the devices like this, you're essentially causing uh, negatively charged oxygen anions to drift. I mean, that's the opposite of the drifting of the, of, so the vacancies are going to the top electrode, the oxygen anions are going to the bottom. They discharge on this bottom electrode, they release oxygen gas, that oxygen gas builds up, and after a while you will get enough pressure where it will just blow out the top. Uh, and then, but, but then, interestingly, at that point in time, you've got to work the device. All right? That's the uh, 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 sort of an, an interesting issue. So now that we've got working devices made by whatever, whatever uh, 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 way of making them, what I want to do now is I want to go through what is the appropriate way of measuring these devices. How do you actually uh, uh, look at the characteristics? And so again, I'm going to go back to these two equations here. What you need to do is you need to be monitoring in time the conduction of the device and you need to be watching the evolution of the state of the device. So how do you do that? Well, you have to do a whole series of experiments. I mean, at first, when you're doing them manually, they're very, very tedious. But eventually, you know, you have a, a really smart postdoc who figures out how to automate all this stuff. And you just put your device and punch a button and away it goes. Right? What you do is you essentially do a, a pump probe type of, of system. Remember, all your, all your measurements have to be made as a function of time. So here you have, you're measuring uh, in a four-point probe type of technique, uh, the internal voltage inside the device and the current flowing through the device. 
essentially as a function of time. And so what do you do? You do a, a small measurement, a small perturbation measurement here, in which you're essentially determining the state of the device. And then you give the device a pulse, and that pulse causes the device to evolve. Then you measure the state of the device again, you pulse it, measure, pulse, measure. In this particular case, what you see is that the width of these pulses is actually increasing exponentially. So that with some number of pulses, a uh, hundred or so, you can essentially uh, evolve the device over time frames which range from microseconds to tens of seconds. That's essentially what we did here. All right? Now, so you wind up with, uh, for a particular voltage, for a particular internal voltage, you wind up essentially with something like 100 current voltage characteristics. And then what you do is you change the voltage. And then you do it again. And then you change the voltage and you do it again. You change the voltage and you do it again. So what you're doing is you're watching the state evolve in time and as you're changing the excitation. All right? Now what do you get? Well, you get a large number of current voltage characteristics. And you can plot those current voltage characteristics like this. And for these particular devices, we fit the current voltage characteristics to a lot of different possible uh, uh, explanations. Because, but, but if you notice, that this is exponential, current's exponential voltage. So one of the, the things that we fit these devices to was the Simmons tunneling equation. And in fact, when we do that, we can fit, essentially, with a one consistent set of parameters, and then with one thing varying, okay, essentially the width of the tunnel barrier, we can fit 440 uh, IV characteristics extremely well with this one consistent set of experiments. And so essentially, you know, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, whatever, uh, what this shows is that the, cur that, that, that the quasi-static conduction mechanism in these devices is tunneled. Okay? Now, what we, what we do is we determine a whole bunch of things. We actually get the, the, the size of the, of, of, of the tunnel barrier. But the most important thing that we get is the width of the tunnel barrier out of these measurements. So now what we can do is with those results, we can plot the width of the tunnel barrier that we get from our uh, measurements versus, okay, versus the time. Okay? So here it is over uh, six orders of magnitude in time from microseconds to tens of seconds, how the tunnel barrier width uh, evolves for different applied voltages. Okay? And we do that for both off switching and on switching. We can fit these curves here to, to really god awful looking curves that look like this. Now the, the, the problem is that drift diffusion uh, doesn't have uh, a simple analytical form. So what we had to do was, was approximate the drift diffusion equations using some analytical approximations that we did. And this is the, this is the equations that we come up with. And what you'll notice is you have an exponential of an exponential here. It's kind of, that's kind of a, a gross, uh, but, there, but there's a, a simple physical reason for it. The, the, the current, uh, the conduction is, is, is exponential because of tunneling. And you have another exponential because of this exponential drift phenomenon in the system. But uh, essentially, you can, you can do fits to this, these sets of curves here. And now you wind up with these expressions, essentially the time dependence of the state variable for the device. And the state variable of the device is the width of the tunnel gap in the device. And we get this, this sort of complete time and voltage dependence. And now, with these equations, you can calculate any property of the device you want to know. And you can take these equations and drop them into a SPICE model. And you can, uh, and, and, and you can run circuit simulations for any circuit that you want to have. So um, you know, what, what I essentially claim is, once you've got these two equations here, you've got everything that you need. It, it tells you everything that you want to know, that everything important circuit wise that you want to know about the device. So uh, our, our uh, model that we get out of these electroform devices sort of looks like this. You've got titanium dioxide. You have a conducting channel here, a metallic channel. 
And uh, tomorrow, uh, John Paul Strachan is going to talk about exactly what this is. We've actually gone in and done spectrum microscopy on these things, and so we know exactly what this thing is. But I will, I will, I will tell you now, and I have to come back and, and listen to that part. But there is essentially a gap of about two nanometers that's left between there, and the switching is actually diffusion and drift of oxygen vacancies from this region here up into this region and back as you push it back and forth. And the total distance over which these things are diffusing is about half a nanometer. 0.5 nanometers is all it takes to change the resistance of these devices by a factor of 1,000. So you turn your voltage on. These, these, these little guys uh, drift about half a nanometer. You've gone from, from off state to on state. Reverse the voltage, push them back. So all you're doing to turn the device on and off is to take literally a handful of vacancies. So you calculate how many you need. In a small device, it's only a handful. And all you're doing is you're moving them about half a nanometer back and forth. That's, that's, the, uh, uh, that's, that, that's the switching in these devices. So we've actually taken some of these devices and we've ripped them open and looked inside of them uh, using, in this particular case, AFM. That's the channel. Okay, there it is. Other people have looked at this in various ways, but uh, 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 you know, uh, and, and to know what this thing is, you've got to come back tomorrow. So as I as I said before, if you have W dot, if you've got, if you have the dynamical equation, the equation that tells you how the state variable evolves in time. Now you can calculate anything you want to know about the device. You can calculate what's the what's the on time. Or the, for a particular device, the on switching time and the off switching time for particular applied voltages to the system. You can calculate the energy, the on switching energy. You can calculate the lifetime of the uh, uh, of the device. Now, what's interesting is that the W dots that we uh, uh, measure, if you try to calculate the lifetime of the state, it diverges. It says the lifetime is infinite. So, uh, but it also tells us that uh, that these devices. Uh, can and do switch in uh, nanoseconds uh, if you apply, uh, you know, uh, voltages or, or currents in this particular case for off switching on the order of say uh, a, a, a few hundred microamps and in this case uh, a, a few milliamps, which is a lot for these particular devices. But uh, but it, the, the time is so short that the power or the energy is actually very small. So you, you, you wind up being essentially in the uh, uh, picajoule uh, types of energies that are required for this curve switching. Okay, so we built circuits. Uh, uh, this is a, a circuit, we published this uh, 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 about halfway through last year. This is actually a circuit which is intended to be a field program with a beta ray. Uh, so this uh, uh, works quite nicely. Uh, but uh, Dina Strukoff, uh, who actually has just uh, uh, left Hewlett-Packard and is now starting his assistant professorship at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, right as he was leaving, he had an absolutely great idea, and we just published this paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I'm just going to sort of tease you with that. Uh, it would take a very, very long time to explain this. It took, it took me months to actually figure out what was going on here. Uh, but essentially, we've, what Dima did and what we have done uh, uh, since then is we have figured out how to take layers, uh, crossfire layers of memristors and stack them up on a single layer of CMOS and be able to uniquely address any device in one of these layers with a very small amount of CMOS and a very small amount of, of, uh, of uh, beads in the system to the point where we actually think that it's physically possible to address as many as a thousand layers. So if, if we have each layer with a terabit of memory in each layer, we have a thousand layers, well, that's a lot of memory. So where are we going with all of this? Well, as a digital device, uh, memristors are really very interesting for flash, DRAM, hard disk, SRAM, and heck, even eventually CDs and DVDs. And as a, you know, within Hewlett Packard, we're essentially pushing them. We, this, this, you know, we're we're, we're going we're to try to commercialize uh, uh, this type of system, and we're going to go after these uh, these types of models here. Uh, it's high density, it's stackable, and what I haven't even mentioned yet is because you have this large resistance ratio, it's multi-bit. 
So the, 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 the total amount of storage you can conceive of in these devices, which is just absolutely non-volatile in geological time frames, is staggering. Uh, so that's 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 a that's going to be a very very big and important uh, uh, area. However, we've, we've built a, a, a circuit which looks like an FPGA, so you can not, not only use these things as configuration bits, but you can also use them to route signals through through circuits. And so we're looking at FPGAs and defect tolerance and sparing types of issues in other types of circuitry as well. And then finally, the thing that may actually wind up being the most important application of inverters is not their digital applications, but analog applications in synaptic and neural systems. That's another thing that we're going after in a fairly big way. But I don't have the time to, to do that. So I think I've run out of time, so I'll just stop here. I hope we have some time to take some questions. <laughs> You talked about a really small active area that the state variable switches through, so like half a nanometer. Yes. So do you have a sense of like actually how many atoms or like don't well, of course, the, the, the how many atoms depends upon the area. Okay? And so if you're if you're working with a device which is say 50 nanometers uh, in diameter, you're talking about tens of atoms. Tens of atoms, tens of vacancies, yes. In this concept, the, the, the defect question comes into play in terms of defects affecting both vacancy and nine motion. Okay, so how do you minimize that? Well, uh, I mean, you know, one man's defect is another man's uh, uh, dopant in, in this particular aspect here. So, so the, the, the issue winds up being uh, how carefully can you effectively dope them into the system to begin with? How, how well can you control them? And the fact is that in a, in a functioning device, you're only having to move these things half an nanometer. You've got a small number, you're moving them half an nanometer, that's all it takes to, to operate this device. And so, from that standpoint, uh, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a big problem. But you have to move the same number consistently every time in every device. Well, uh, there, there may be interesting ways of titrating to get to, to, to get to that. No, no, the, the, that, that's, that's a complete red herring. The, uh, we can build these devices intentionally without having any sort of filament or, or uh, uh, channel or anything. Uh, I, I, I show this in some sense for historical reasons. And again, I'm, this is a teaser. You can find out what that thing is tomorrow. Uh, but, but, but the filament itself has nothing to do with the switching. Correct. So that the switching occurs in that half nanometer thickness. So what we're, we're, what is the, the scale of the convenience. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's all about convenience. When, 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 you, uh, when you either build the device from scratch, or you, uh, you, you do some sort of electroforming, you have in mind what range, what resistance you want this thing to have. And so electroforming processes tend to essentially, people essentially stop electroforming when the device gets to where they want it to be. Or if you just build them from, from scratch, you just, you just make the thing as thick as you want it to be to have the resistance ratio that you want. So if you want to have you know, a giga ohm uh, off state, you need a two nanometer thick layer of oxide. Uh, we don't have we don't have the, the, the best handle on that uh, because you can't make a very large device. Uh, if you try to make a large device, there are fluctuations in the interface that are, that, that essentially cause the device to uh, be localized within a within a large contact. So in fact, uh, if you if you look at the sort of resistances over a very large range. Of, of, of fabricated area sizes, you find out that the that the actual resistance doesn't vary much. Okay, so so that's that's that was why it was sort of important to understand the the. the um, 
No, it does scale, but you have to, you have to know how to do it. Okay. If you're if you're if you're smaller than 50 nanometers, then it starts to scale. Pretty much, yeah. But there's there's also there's also, there's a bunch of caveats. It's too a little bit, a little bit uh, too much to do. Uh, most of your devices are vertical devices. Have you ever observed the memoristic switching in planar devices? Yes. What what are the length scales that one can tolerate in planar? Devices? Roughly the same, uh, tens of nanometers or less. Who specifies the volume of the validation which had a specific prediction on how this memory state uh, phenomenon scaled with the thickness. It was a one over B squared behavior. Well, that, 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 that prediction was based on uh, linear drift and ohmic resistance. So the actual devices that we have, the drift is exponential and the conduction is exponential. So the last equation that I showed, <coughs> the W dot equation, had a double exponential. Instead of instead of d squared, it's an exponential of an exponential. Replace it. Yes. And the second question is uh, about cyclability. I guess it connects to the question that that uh, how many cycles do these guys last? Is it how we produce? We we, we have we have never seen a device itself fail. What fails are the wires. The, what fails what fails in these things are the wires that are connected to the devices. We've never actually seen the device itself. Fail. We can't say that about the device has has failed because the, device, the, the wires essentially uh, uh, burn up or, or or break by by, by electrical migration, whatever, uh, before we actually have a problem with the actual device. Um, titanium oxide by itself is an insulator with a large band gap, like Correct. EV. So if you now put platinum electrodes, it will form kind of a shocky contact. Correct. Right? And until, unless the material gets really, really conductive, you will always assume that the whole structure is fully depleted. So uh, now what you're doing is you're moving oxygen vacancies in your system, which are some dopants. Why does the resistance change? Why is that fully determined by the, by the contact properties? Essentially, what's going on here is if you have a uh, a wide enough gap. All of all of the uh, sort of put, as you're switching the device on, all of the all of the current is essentially coming in the device. Okay. Okay. And so uh, uh, you're you're right. I mean the the, the 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 titanium dioxide itself is fully depleted. And what you're doing is you're funneling through that. But you are essentially. Uh, going from your, your, uh, a Schottky barrier, which you see here, which is the off state, when you have a wide gap. And in that particular case, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 you've got uh, you know, blocking uh, a type of, of, of system. And, and as you cause the vacancies to drift, you're essentially making a, a, a region of what is really metallic material, because this is not a, a low doping. I mean, if you actually work out the the, the concentrations. The concentration is like 10 to the 21. All right. So this is really metallic. Uh, uh, when you when you have these these vacancies, the, the the percentage is like a percent or so of vacancies in the system. So that so that material is metallic. So really, what you've got is a metallic system which is uh, drifting, and what you're looking at is just the is just the transport through whatever uh, depleted titanium oxide is left. We need, um, actually, we've got plenty of other discussion time, so we need to see people on the schedule we need to move on. So we can thank Stan again.
sitting down for two hours. Okay, fair So our second talk this morning is given by Professor Leon Farr from UC Berkeley. Resistor switching implies feminism. So bear with us on the technology because we can't get the that thing to go right up the go on the big screen. So I hope everyone will be able to see. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. And I'd like to also thank uh, Stan Williams, who really is a hero here. Uh, he was uh, awfully generous to sign my work, but he was really HP and, and his uh, leadership the been uh, all uh, so interesting. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to uh, talk today is uh, actually a, a, a circuit theory perspective. Uh, since I'm not a device person, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, there may be some, some jargon that uh, you may or may not uh, understand, but I will try to make it clear as possible. Okay, uh, essentially what I'm trying to say is that uh, whenever you do switching using ch the resistance change as the basis, you are really talking about a memory store, or more precise, a generalized form of memory. I'm going to generalize memory store. And, and it's generally in the sense that it actually possesses all the same properties that you would expect from the, the ideal one. And so there's no reason to uh, invent new names for devices that exhibit the same behavior. Uh, I want to start by motivating why I'm talking uh, uh, from a certain perspective. <coughs> and, uh, I was somewhat sort of uh, uh, frustrated over the years to see a, a large number of papers published that I uh, that are presumed to be models. And, and yet, uh, uh, let me focus this a bit better. Thank you. If I also plug uh, this, uh, please don't raise your hand because I'm not looking back for you. Okay. So, uh, uh, the, a device model really, you know, is it, incorrect in my perspective if it cannot predict its response uh, to a variety of input signals, uh, such as uh, sine wave or varying amplitude amplitude of frequencies. Uh, a model ought to be able to predict uh, for uh, the response when you put in uh, arbitrary signals, or at least open a broad class of signals of interest. Okay. And in this perspective, <coughs> I consider the, the three common mistakes that I want to sort of go over with you. Uh, uh, many papers published, and, and this typically involved uh, models that uh, also would say that, that it has hysteresis or that it has frequency-dependent parameters, and it has, or, or it has time-dependent parameters. And I'm going to show you uh, just a few of these examples uh, to tell you that, in my perspective, these are not really uh, models. These are, these are perspective, these are manifestation, but they are not models. Uh, so, so first, let's look at some examples of uh, nano devices that exhibit hysteresis, and uh, the. There are many, but I just want to show this one uh, first. Uh, this is from, most of you know, Lieber from Harvard University. Uh, in 2002, we published a, 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 a nice paper called Non-Volatile Memory with Nanowires. And uh, he showed, uh, among other things, uh, the, this curve, uh, in which you have, should not be familiar with many of those curves that Stan Williams just showed you. And, uh, and then, uh, but, what he did show, and, uh, and most people did show, is that this, of course, is trace experiment with some input signal, say a sine wave, a periodic wave. Uh, what is not mentioned, and which I verified with him, uh, was I talk, gave a talk last year, and I confirmed that with him that, in fact, when you change the frequency, you don't even change the waveform, just sine wave. If you just change the frequency, this shape is going to change completely, or, or quite drastically. And so, so if you only change the frequency, you already get a different shape. So, so it's completely unpredictable. It's not a model. If you cannot predict anything, uh, uh, then it's not a model, in my, in my perspective. Now, when we're talking about uh, the resistance switching in the, in the ideal case, and when we talk about resistance, I understood it as just Ohm's law, that's what a resistance is. So Ohm's law is just in the VI plane, it's just V, the, res the slope is, is resistance, and you flip from one to the other, but the difference here is that 
it is self flipping. It, 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 you don't put in, uh, you know, you don't crack it and switch. It's the, it, the voltage is served or the current is served that causes the switch. And, and this is the most ideal form. And, but again, you notice that it all goes through the origin here. And, and again, it is not predictive in the sense that if you change the frequency, things are going to change. And uh, so this is the second uh, uh, example from perspective of today's lecture. And they are, they are literally many, many. So this is another one uh, published by uh, uh, heroes. I showed you it was way back, 1976. I just want to point out that all of this uh, at this, what I call pinch history is true. Uh, this is more, more recent origin back in Bed Nose. Uh, uh, they showed that. And so let's go on to 203. Uh, and, and almost every issue now you can see uh, things like that. So these are all manifestations.